I'm Emma Lubich, and you're watching Can TV. We're here today with Jenny Biggs from Raise Your Hand, Illinois. So thank you so much for being with us today. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. So talk to us about the work that you do at Raise Your Hand. Um, we are a citywide parent advocacy organization. Uh, we're based in Chicago, and to be honest, most of our recent work is uh, very Chicago-centric. Uh, we're 10 years old. We started with Chicago parents. Um, pretty much sitting around a kitchen table. Um, and we've, uh, we've grown uh, into an organization um, that still has a lot of room to grow. Uh, Chicago is a big place geographically. Um, schools have all sorts of needs um, that are going unaddressed. Um, and uh, there's just, there's just a, a lot of work to do. Uh, basically, we try to engage parents, um, share solid information with them, whether that just be the latest news, events where they can learn more or participate or become active. And we also try to provide resources uh, with the goal being that they as parents can become empowered um, to either advocate at their own school level for changes and to also just protect and strengthen public education and to also join us um, with our work is really more uh, systemic or district-wide work. Um, so we help parents advocate at the school level, but we hope they will join us to advocate for all children uh, for equitable resources across the system so that we're, uh, so it's not just about our own kids, it's about every kid. So it's been an incredibly difficult summer leading up to the start of the school year. Uh, so let's start by discussing CPS's decision to reverse their initial plan to hold in-person classes. So raise your hand as well as CTU and other community voices push for remote learning. So can you talk to me about why you advocated for remote learning as the safest way to resume classes this fall? Uh, there, there were a number of reasons. Um, number one, in May, we conducted an, a survey for parents about remote learning. It actually was not about what should happen when we go back to school because it was May. So, you know, we were all hopeful we were going to go back to school. Um, and by back to school, I mean actually physically in buildings. Um, and uh, when we finally were able to analyze uh, the results, we found like parents had incredible ideas on how to make remote learning better and stronger. Um, and also parents were itemizing in their comments um, many safety and health concerns um, about going back to school potentially in the fall. A lot of concerns about buildings already not being up to cleanliness standards for multiple years now and how in the world are they actually going to keep these facilities um, clean and virus free. Um, so we saw a lot of a lot of concern um, from parents about going back, but we also saw a lot of parents recognizing that not everyone's needs were being met academically, socially, emotionally, um, and the best place is to be back in the buildings with teachers. Um, and then, you know, to be honest, we are we really are, were following the the science and. Over and over, parents told us in this survey that the science needs to be followed. And um, if it's the metrics aren't looking good, we shouldn't be putting our kids at risk and we shouldn't be putting our teachers at risk and the wider community at risk. Um, so as the summer went on and the metrics just didn't seem to be improving, um, we started talking internally about like, I, yeah, this is just not looking really good. And we had the survey. And then when the hybrid model plan came out, there were just so many unanswered questions that really made parents really uneasy. Um, and I do want to acknowledge that, you know, we don't hear from every parent across the city. So certainly there are a number of parents um, that, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't agree with this assessment. As a matter of fact, someone spoke at the board yesterday that they think the kids should be back at school. So, you know, the the, I guess like the number one thing I've learned through this experience is that there is no right answer at all. Um, 
nobody wants to be in this position of teaching or learning remotely, uh, but we at Raise Your Hand feel this is the position we're in, um, that in order to keep uh, the entire city safe and healthy, um, we have to do this remote learning again, and we need to make it the best that we possibly can uh, so that we can, you know, so that we're addressing all of the academic needs of all of the kids, as well as, unfortunately, a lot of just, you know, basic needs are going to be, uh, still continue to need to be met. Um, so, yeah, it was complicated. <laughs> uh, and we heard a lot of, and we're still hearing different views. Um, but that's, I mean, basically it came down to us, to the science, and as well as just hearing and seeing all the unanswered questions. Um, and hearing so many parents just say they weren't going to send their kid if it was hybrid, they were going to choose the remote. So, uh, yep. And so do you think that now the remote learning plan that CPS has released, do you think that it's adequate? And I mean, do you think that if they had chosen to go remote sooner, that teachers and schools would have been able to better prepare for remote learning in the fall? I do think if they would have chosen to do this sooner that yes, if there would have been a lot more time, um, not only to plan the mechanics of the remote learning, but also to get kids and families ready for, for what CPS is calling day one. Um, I'm, I'm, I don't feel confident that every child is going to have internet access on September 8th when Chicago Public Schools starts their school year. I also don't feel confident that every child is going to have a device. Um, and I, I do think remote or hybrid, um, you know, a lot of that movement by CPS um, to get devices and internet into the hands of families um, was delayed to begin with. It probably should have been started in like May and I mean, I understand that there's a lot of limiting factors to getting these things in place, um, but we're really concerned uh, about just the basics being met to actually be able to show up like I'm showing up right now with you on September 8th at 8 a.m. Um, and we are hearing grumblings from various places um, that parents who feel they should be eligible for the Chicago Connected program are being denied. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to kind of get to the bottom of what that is about. CPS says, does have an eligibility tool on the Chicago Connected webpage. Um, so they are prioritizing rightly um, certain students um, given their, their circumstances at home. Um, but I'm, I'm, uh, there's a lot of confusion on what that means. Um, we were on a call with CPS with LSC members last week, and they said that CPS was determining this list of eligible uh, families and that CPS was giving that list to principals with the idea being principals then would know and they could help do outreach so that parents would know about this opportunity. Uh, but someone today told me that their principal said he didn't put her on the list. So I don't really know um, really what the mechanics are and um, uh, what um, I know the CTU has mentioned this and we hosted a remote learning uh, event this past weekend with uh, Logan Square Neighborhood Association. Um, Logan Square Neighborhood Association, their parent mentors and youth leaders wrote a remote learning statement, which is really fantastic. I recommend people go look up uh, Logan Square Neighborhood Association remote learning statement because it's, it's very family centric. And one of the things they propose, and the CTU also proposes this, is to have like a slower start to the school year, um, where the first week or two is really used by teachers and staff to figure out what every family's needs are and try to get those in place before you actually start the academic year. It also would involve um, meetings of some sort. They could be remotely, they could be socially distanced in masks. Um, I mean, obviously safety has to come first, but uh, uh, not just to like get the basics in place, but also to build some relationships before we actually have to embark on this distance learning um, 
well, experiment really uh, that begins at the beginning of the year. Um, and I mean, I would say we as Raise Your Hand uh, really support that, but we don't, we don't see that happening. Um, and I think that's going to come back to haunt us, uh, that we're not going to be completely prepared for every child on day one. Right. And so talk a little bit more about the Chicago Connected program, because I think that the lack of access is really a major concern, especially in a school situation like we have with CPS. So just talk about the Chicago Connected program and whether you think that it is adequate. Um, I, I, it's, it has excellent intentions. Um, it seems to be CPS, City of Chicago, um, some bigger organizations that actually have resources and the infrastructure to, to actually, you know, move it forward. Um, they, they have, uh, um, was the, they've co contracted or, um, I guess that's the correct term to use with community based organizations, which is a brilliant idea. Um, because many uh, CPS said on this um, presentation that I saw last week that in order to get people to respond to this offer, there has to be a level of trust. Uh, they said they've been texting and emailing and calling and you know, I, I would be the same way. I would kind of ignore some of that if I don't know who it's coming from. Um, so they were rightly um, working with community based organizations who directly work with parents so they can not only tell them about the program and get them um, signed up for it, but they can also then do tech support afterwards to, you know, I mean, this is also a um, an issue is parents <laughs> being able to actually use the tech. Uh, I mean, luckily my kids are older, so I haven't had to do a whole lot um, with getting them set up. But for the littler kids, uh, it's a lot of work for parents just to get the tech set up. So uh, the Chicago Connected, there is a web page. Um, if you Google it, you'll find it. There is on the web page an eligibility tool. So you can actually put in your student ID number and I forget what else, and they will tell you right then if you're eligible. Mm -hmm. um, there's also an FAQs page, which I found very helpful because it tells you who will be qualifying. On this CPS call last week, it sounded like they had like concentric, concentric circles of who they're trying to reach. So they're starting with, you know, children with um, housing instability first, and then they're moving out from there. I think they said something like they have eight waves of eligible students, um, and they intend to have 100,000 kids connected. Um, I mean, I guess my concern is when they said this week that they had 18,000 kids signed up, I don't know if that means they signed up for the program or they actually right, ha right now have internet service. Like we need them to like right now have internet service so that it could be any bugs can be worked out between now and September 8th. So I'm a, I'm a little skeptical that um, what does signed up mean um, and what the timeline is. Um, so, but I encourage parents to use that eligibility tool and see if they're eligible and to look at the FAQs because you need to get started as soon as possible to get this uh, set up in your home. And so I think another thing that people are concerned about is um, the grab and go meals. So do you know that those will continue into the fall? This is an excellent question. I actually just tweeted at Chicago Public Schools about an hour ago <laughs> to ask <laughs> what was happening next week because the summer meals program in their initial communications and even now says it ends October 28th, which is tomorrow. Um, and we still have another week before school starts. Um, I, you know, I'm actually really concerned about this because someone shared an article with us yesterday about the, I mean, this is a federal program, and about the federal program and um, how it, there needs to be certain waivers added to it so that you can have something like what we have now, where it's a grab and go, uh, because during the school year, it's actually to get that money you have to have a congregate setting and there's certain time frames that it could be served um, so there's real concern at the federal level that um, 
what we have right now, summer meals, will not be what happens at the beginning of the school year. And to be honest, I have not heard what's going to happen locally at this point. Um, but I do know that I don't know what's happening officially starting Monday. Um, so I'm hope, I mean, I'm hoping there's another week of the summer meals program and I'm hoping then summer meals program just continues on Tuesday. Um, and I have a feeling that CPS is going to do whatever it takes to make it work like that for as long as possible. But I have a feeling if the, this federal thing does not get ironed out appropriately that um, it, there might be some differences and it's something people should look out for. Right. And so now if we can pivot, so a huge focal point of community members has been the issue of police officers or school resource officers in Chicago public schools. So raise your hand has strongly advocated for the removal of these SROs from CPS. So why is this your position? Um, the research backs it. Um, I am actually, I was a high school teacher for seven years in the South suburbs. So I mean, I knew about this research as a teacher in the nineties going into the two thousands and um, about the school to prison pipeline. Um, so basically the research backs it. We at Raise Your Hand, I think, uh, really became um, enlightened on the issue uh, because it was really brought to our attention by youth and their movement to, um, about policing in general, but definitely about the school resource officers getting police out of the schools, but also their, the youth led movement, um, No Cop Academy, about uh, city funds being used to build a cop academy at the same time that our schools are underfunded. So um, I would say the youth have, have really enlightened us in our positions and in our work. Um, and, you know, they've led the way. We've kind of just, we see some things they're doing, we elevate it. Um, we've done our own research that's relevant to them and we can elevate it and give it to them. Um, and then I would say what really like kind of sparked us um, was the city IG report about the, <laughs> um, so let's see, this would have been, I believe in 2018, about all the unknowns, CPS and CPD could not give a list of schools where SROs were present. They could not give a list of the officers that were in the schools. They were not providing any training. Questions were coming up about this gang database. Um, and those were coming from parents whose children were impacted by this denial of the gang database and also students were bringing it up and now we find out that it must have been being used because that's one of the reforms that were put into the IGA agreement yesterday. So um, between the youth and just the egregious um, pieces of this program that put child safety at risk every day just really, um, I would say, pushed us over the edge and made it uh, a piece of our work. And also this particular year, we ramped up our work with local school councils. Um, we hired a part-time organizer. We worked with community-based organizations to do um, trainings in neighborhoods about what an LSC is, why you should run. Um, we were helping people to get their campaign ready when schools were shut down. Um, so we had all these different connections with LSC members during the school shutdown. We had um, 13 calls with LSC members um, over Zoom and, you know, the SROs came up over and over again because the vote was given to local school councils. So um, our organizer um, just really, uh, really kicked into full gear and hosted teach-ins advised LSCs on like the basics of like the Open Meetings Act and just conducting a meeting to make sure you have um, community uh, engagement. Um, she made this amazing 
um, LSC toolkit for SROs, um, which has a lot of the missing research that was not in the CPS toolkit for LSCs on SROs. So it's just, um, it's just, we, uh, it's just been um, a, a true focus of our work recently. And it's, it really came from um, the youth kind of showing us the way. Right. And so the Board of Ed voted yesterday to keep SROs in schools. So can you react to that decision? Uh, you know, I, I was really um, personally disappointed, um, sad, angry. Um, it, I, but I also was just really proud and hopeful um, because, uh, again, like the, the, it was the youth that really, really brought this to where it is right now. And where it is right now is it's still there, uh, which it shouldn't be, but it went from a $33 million contract to a $12 million contract. Um, there are some reforms in the IGA that were well needed, um, particularly getting rid of the, um, I forget what they call them, the devices that allows access to the gang database in the on school grounds um the the hiring practices of the sros which by the way they said last year um and that didn't happen apparently if they need to put it in again this year um but <laughs> so i mean we're we're skeptical um but i you know this I, I'm proud of the work that was done by the youth and I'm proud that we were able to, um, you know, work with them and, um, and elevate what they've been doing. And they're, they're not going to stop. They are focused. They're determined. Um, they have, they're research based and they're also narrative based. These kids have real stories that, um, that, that need to be heard. Um, so, yeah, that's where I'm at. It's a lot of emotions. <laughs> and so what, what is next for Raise Your Hand? Where is the focus of your energy going now? That's a good question. Um, we, of course, have, we do a lot of um, special education work. We also hosted about 13 Zoom calls over the school um, closings with special ed parents. And remote learning is really difficult for kids with special needs and a lot of parent demands and parent concerns in the spring went unanswered and we don't see any answers in the um, guidance we're seeing right now. Uh, so I think a, a lot of our work is probably going to be um, with special education and remote learning. Um, Local school council elections were moved to November. We think there might be a new nomination period opened um, for people to choose to run and also for people who may have wanted to run in the spring. Maybe they don't want to run anymore. Um, so we're going to ramp up local school council work um, by working with with, again, various community-based organizations to hold training, some of them very basic, what's an LSC, why run, and some of them a little bit more like, you know, LSCs in budget, LSCs in principal hiring. Um, so uh, those, are, those are two focus areas. Um, we do a lot of just sharing of information and resources. Um, as I think this remote learning next week, the week before school starts, and then into probably the third or fourth week of school, we're going to be hearing a lot of parent feedback and emotion um, about how it's going. And, uh, you know, the remote learning, it, it, what happened in the spring was it was super variable school to school. It was super variable teacher to teacher. Um, so it was, uh, it was, it was, there was just a, a lot going on uh, with parents. Um, but luckily, I feel like parents this summer have really um, activated themselves and have tr tried to really create support systems and tap into support systems 
to get ready for the fall. Um, so I think we'll be doing a lot of um, calming people down <laughs> by hopefully giving them real information and resources to hold on to and use uh, to try to get through this rough time in public education. <laughs>